Hi, I'm Lisa Johnson, Assistant Professor and Instructional Design Specialist with Ashford University's College of Education. And this year I attended the 2014 International Convention of AECT in Jacksonville, Florida. And this is my conference learning summary. It's a bit long, but it's a share back for our learners as well as colleagues. A disclaimer is that the information reported on the slides for session descriptions is adapted from the conference program and the narration you'll hear is from my notes during the sessions and only represents my interpretation of the conference events that I attended. Thanks in advance for your time viewing this conference learning summary. I hope you learn a lot. So first, let's talk a little bit about what happened at the conference on a social level. The professional learning community was expanded big time. I met some really great folks, and here are just a few of the highlights. Dr. Barb Hall, who you see pictured in the lower left of the screen, is actually a colleague of mine at Ashford University, but she lives in North Carolina while I live in Florida, so we rarely get to spend time together. We went out to dinner with Janine Lim, who's out on a limb on Twitter, and she's pictured there with Barb. We had a lot of really great conversations about distance learning. I also had the distinct honor of interacting with Dr. Charles Regaluth a few times at the conference, including riding the shuttle back to the airport with him, an all-around swell guy who I am pleased to say was very engaged on Twitter during the conference. Next you have the Alice Keeler and Rob Moore, Mind Innovator and Alice Keeler on Twitter, and these folks were also really great learning partners. So I was really pleased to expand my professional learning community with these folks and many others during the conference experience. I suggest you check them out on Twitter and follow their feeds as well as their conference back channel from this conference and other conferences they'll attend. Now in terms of me, that's me pictured there on the left and I'm at Curious Mind on Twitter. You can also follow me there and follow the conference back channel from the hashtag ACT14 or contact ACT directly at AECT. And these are just a few pictures of the beautiful waterfront in Jacksonville as well as the welcoming sign that the waterfront, the riverfront there in Jacksonville put up for us. All right, without further ado, let's get into the sessions. The first up is the session that I helped present with Dr. Gina Connor, who's also from Ashford University. And it's titled, Faculty or Instructional Designer, Creating a Culture of Collaborative Course Design and Development. And the link there on the slide you can take you to the slides on SlideShare if you'd like to see the presentation. This was a practice proposal that reported on the pilot of a course design and development process within our College of Education. The revised process presented has created a collaborative course design and development experience and produce strongly aligned and engaging, empowering, and effective courses and programs. We're still collecting the data and we look forward to publishing on the results of this practice in the near future. But for the time being, this session reported on the culture changes, associated personnel and process calibrations, and examples of our successes and challenges this far with the pilot of the new course design handbook. So I hope you'll check that out on SlideShare and feel free to contact me with any questions about the session that I presented. We also attended a, a really great session at the conference called the Green Book for a Preview. And significant changes as the conference description notes have been occurring in learning theory and instructional theory since the publication of volume three three of instructional design theories and models, which in case you don't know is one of the quintessential tomes in the field of instructional design and recommended reading by everyone. So the facilitators and presenters had a very engaging session and one of the things that I was most excited about was their emphasis on the Voorhees and Voorhees chapter, who happen to also be close personal friends of mine, but they're writing on competency-based education or competency-based instruction. And so this is a really exciting book for me because I have friends that have published in it, but also it's an exciting book because it's the next step in the iteration of the Green Book series, and I highly recommend it for everyone. The presentation provided an overview or preview of the chapters in Volume 4, which were collected into three primary sections as mentioned in the description, blending the nature of instruction, engaging students in the learner-centered instruction, and expanding access to educational opportunities, which are all very very, 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 very much on the forefront of ID experience and practice as we know it today. So next up, the session on pedagogical features influencing instructional activities in a discussion board forum. And this was presented by a couple of folks at the University of Missouri. This session emphasized the importance of the obvious that to anyone who's taught online, the profile pictures and the layout of discussions matter. But using solid data from studies, this particular presentation supported these conclusions. And basically, this is what effective research is all about. So it was a great session. The presenters discussed how information foraging theory and pedagogical usability were supporting frameworks and noted that information foraging theory was most useful for discovering what information was sought in discussions most often and how it was found. 
while pedagogical usability was useful for determining the features of the learning management system that fostered more engagement and more effective learning outcomes. They noted that the ability to easily track and respond to student posts was most important feature needed in a system as reported by instructors and how we can assume the same would be true of students. That is, having the capacity to find and respond to specific posts easily in a discussion forum is paramount. An unanswered question from the study was whether the preference for the new or the older learning management system varies significantly among those with more experience in online discussion forums or whether experience in the older system had any discernible impact on the results and the preference for the new system. But in all, this was a very useful, useful research study and report, and I hope you'll read the description there on the screen as well. Feel free to pause the video at any time to read the descriptions. So the next session I'm going to overview is the role of contextualized learning when designing for problem solving. And this had numerous presenters from multiple universities. The presenters emphasized the need for scaffolding and introducing curriculum and design interventions into classrooms as long-term relationships geared towards shared responsibility for the outcome of interventions with educators as key to stakeholders in the process so that the applications of the intervention, if successful, is sustained. This emphasized to me the importance of designing for action research, which necessarily includes all stakeholders as a key to success in the interventions from research to interventions. So action research and practitioners, if you're working in that area, it's just best to include all stakeholders so that your solutions are sustainable after the research period ends. One presenter emphasized that everyday experience in a given situation is the primary source of human learning, which to me is a reminder that humans always start with where we are to get where we may think we want to go or need to be in a problem-centered situation. So experience certainly does matter when solving simple or complex problems. The presenters further emphasized the difference in knowledge, need, and skill acquired when solving well-defined problems as in a classroom setting, and they'll structure problems which are more common in the real world. As I listened to this part of the presentation, it occurred to me that there always seems to be an exaggeration of the distance between problem types, as problems are really layered, much like an onion, and peeling back one solution may reveal less well-defined problems for one individual, or well-defined and clearly structured problems for another. And this suggests to me further that when possible, we can solve problems in teams better, and teams specifically that communicate openly, and also even that the individual can act as a team where the components of me, myself, and I are a sort of critical thinking group internal to oneself, which relates to the concept of metacognition. Stated another way, I can draw on the actual experience of the I, the reflection on what I know or read about in the experience of me, and metacognitively reflect on these by myself. So if you're in the absence of a teammate to learn with, you can always be a critical thinker of your own. So collaboration and problem solving is ideal from a social constructivist angle. We must solve problems alone sometimes, so thinking critically and using metacognitive strategies can assist. However, we could argue also that in this age of connectivity, working alone is really rare. We at least always have a textual or media teammate of some sort by the internet and the access to a wealth of supporting information. Yeah, you can probably tell this session made me think. One presenter also emphasized the case-based reasoning cycle and discussed how prior experience is a key to conceptualized learning responses to problems, which results in a personal scaffold for solving problems in unique circumstances. And these personal scaffolds help us with transfer and new problem situations. The increase in transfer, as it was suggested, is that we use the techniques of asking, how did what you learned from the solving this case remind you of other problems or other cases you've solved in this class or other classes or life generally? And I would suggest that this, at least, is a layered question approach to reflection about current learning and problem-based context that you could use to increase transfer to other contexts. So during this session, I posed the question to the presenters of how they would go about designing a learning experience to allow students to share their own cases rather than stressing about designing cases for learners. The resulting conversation discussed novices and experts and issues of mixed styles in group learning contexts and how students would need a scaffold such as an advanced organizer that gave categories of nuances and situations to be addressed in writing the cases and that this would help ensure the quality was ex that was expected and needed to teach the intended outcomes came from students writing their own cases. But in any case, I asked the question because I'm a big proponent of students writing material, especially students in education fields, since ultimately learning to design is best done by designing. So these were all good points, I thought. And again, this session was very engaging and made me think deeply about design for case-based learning and problem-based learning strategies. So the next section I attended was on the effectiveness of the PIC learning community system. 
Francisca Marshall presented solo, and this was an engaging session about the research described in the session description you see on the screen. The PIC acronym in the title of this session stands for Program in Interdisciplinary Computing, and the study was conducted with learners in the PIC program at Florida State University. In this session, there was also some engaging conversation around the so-called I-generation or digital natives groups and how the LMSs or learning management systems of today generally lack features engaging to that generation, especially in layout and functionality. But I could argue that those same features that appeal to an I generation or digital native would appeal to all generations as they are really more about usability and attractiveness than anything else. But I was left to wonder from this session if the label LCS, which stands for Learning Community System, is just a more descriptive label for an LMS or VLE, which are common terms used for describing systems that facilitate or manage online and blended learning modalities, or whether maybe LCS is best used as a term to define a combination of systems. My experience now, I've seen quite a few implementations, and my experience is that institutions rarely rely on just one system, but usually third-party integrations, as they're known, are quite common common in practice, so maybe LCS is a good term to consider instead of Virtual Learning Environment or VLE and Learning Management System or LMS. In any case, this session summarized how the combined use of Blackboard and BuddyPress resulted in the development of a system with more ideal features for the PIC students than was available in either system alone. So it sounds like they had some great success at Florida State University. Now the next session I attended was a keynote by Johannes Kranje, and there on the site you can see a Google Sites link and as well as his Twitter handle. And Kranje is the Dean of Informatics and Design at Cape Potential University of Technology in Cape Town, South Africa and an international leader in educational technology. The keynote was an activity-based session and the audience was mostly engaged. As it occurred late in the day, honestly, I was rather disengaged from the whole session, compiling notes from the day and reviewing emails, catching up in my classes, which had really accumulated a lot of activity throughout the day. So alas, work is never done on a conference and I did do a great job staying present for the most part over a week. But a major takeaway anyway from the keynote was the concept of rhizomatic learning and how it, in essence, about learning and it's about teaching and learning in a connected world. So if you're interested in learning more about the keynote, check out the website linked on the slide and see the tweets from the speaker. So the next session I attended was actually a design and development session on mobile learning applications, and there were two sessions. One was the needs assessment of a mobile application for a graduate program, and the other was SRSG, a mobile application design framework for group work, both presented by folks from the Florida State University. I have no some images from these sessions, but you may be able to find some on Twitter by searching the hashtag ACT14. In summary, the sessions both emphasize mobility as the future of online learning and how we must design with mobility and multiple device access in mind as instructional designers. The architectures needed to support online learning for multiple devices remains a challenge in the field of teaching and learning and designing for online or connected and mobile learning experiences, which again are on the rise as the norm. And these sessions just simply emphasize that, and you can read the session descriptions there on the screen again by pausing this video to learn more about what the sessions entailed. So the next session was the future of instructional design programs, and this panel discussion focused on the idea of instructional design and technology program reform, and it was facilitated by Ann Mendenhall from UNLV and involved such rock stars as David Merrill and Charles Regaluth, as well as Wilhelmina Sevian from the University of Arizona State University, and Vanessa Denon and Joel Gardner from Florida State and Franklin University. So really, really all-star cast. The discussion was most engaging for me overall. The session was a panel format with no real guiding questions or presentation, and having something other than a blank screen behind the speakers would have been nice, but I will say the conversation was engaging enough that the environment wasn't too distracting. I'll probably say some of the names incorrectly, so bear with me as I attempt to relate the panel information and what they shared and what took place. A lot of really great information in this session. When asked about the future of instructional design programs or ID programs, Merrill started off by suggesting the audience read his paper on the hopes for the future of ID programs. He also spoke of a study of job analyses in the, in the field of ID and says he feels there's a need for basic training of ID skill sets at the bachelor level, while master level degrees would be better reserved for higher and, and technical skills for creating templates, as well as managing others, since most, many, or all people with advanced degrees in instructional design will wind up managing an ID team, so master's level learning must include the domain of management and coursework. Denon spoke mostly about the future of ID programs by noting the cyclical nature of theory in the field and how this necessitates a retooling of programs so that students know the history of the field and theories related thereto 
in order to recognize what is truly new and what is being recycled or enhanced. Next, Gardner spoke questioning the nature of the work IDs will do and said, considered, considering the very context of likely practice as a necessity, he remarked that master level students deserve specific education in both project management and leadership. So sort of echoing what was already said by Merrill. And Regaluth discussed his concern it being with the societal paradigm shift from teacher-centered and instruction-centered design toward learner-centered and learning-centered designs and the implication of this paradigm shift for theory as both following and leading practice. His ideas for education for instructional designers involved his thoughts for the future of programs being centered around the focus on this transformation which has occurred in centering. And then Willie lamented over the overemphasis on technology over principles of practice and she suggested that ideas become more vocal advocates in the field for the pure principles of instructional design beyond just being techies. And I couldn't agree with that more. It's important to have those development skills, but ultimately we have to know the principles of what we're applying before we can do sound development. Questions from the audience can be encapsulated by looking at the ACT14 hashtag and associated back channel on Twitter. One question of note was about whether the increase in jobs will continue in the field or whether the boom, so to speak, is leveling out. Merrill argued that online learning had diluted and lessened the quality of learning designs through bad design and suggested that IDs are needed now more than ever. So as a whole, the panel tended to agree that IDs will continue to have value across many industry sectors that involve learning, which I guess we could say involves all industries to some extent. In my professional opinion, ID is essential to structured or formal education, so as long as we have formal education environments in colleges, schools, trainings, program and military and corporate environments and so forth, we're going to see the need for trained IDs. Today, perhaps more than ever, we see a recognition that ID work is not just an on-the-job training profession as it once was that you go into haphazardly just because you can teach well or you're able to design learning somewhat effectively. It really is a specialized field of study and practice that's come of age in the 21st first century. And degree, degree programs really more than ever have reason to be built on those aforementioned industries in the learning sector and the globing economy. But you know what? I digress here into my own thoughts. I enjoyed the panel and the rock star cast, as I said, and feel blessed to have been part of the conversation. So next was a really interesting session on service learning and internship activities for graduate students in instructional design. And I found these very applicable. Both designers for learning and BASPA virtual university spoke of virtual internships. And there's a link on the screen there for the designers for learning. This series of sessions was described by the program conference book as more and more programs in the field move online, the opportunities to incorporate service learning or internships into these programs may prove challenging. So whether you're a faculty member in the field looking for ways to incorporate these activities into your courses or programs, or a graduate student looking for opportunities, this session will introduce Designers for Learning organization and a virtual internship program through Bath University. So Designers for Learning was up first, and a link to the website, again, is included on the slide. Jennifer spoke about how students are given the experience to serve at universities and assignments that are predetermined for quality and written into the course curriculum. So there's no question that these internships that they offer have value into the curriculum of specific programs. She noted how Designers for Learning facilitates these internship opportunities and that their nonprofit status is new. She also noticed that, noted that one goal of the organization is to facilitate students creating and evaluating to move beyond the lower levels of the cognitive taxonomy when completing coursework. The second session from Bass Spa University spoke of their virtual internship program and emphasized many of the same advantages the Designers for Learning team had emphasized. A big takeaway from this session is the obvious, which is that if inter even if internships are not used in a program, every assignment in an instructional design program needs to add some value for society. All ID work, that is, should be grounded in authentic contexts and be problem-based towards solving real-world authentic design problems that will best prepare instructional designers for real-world application of the skills they are learning in their programs. So next was a really interesting session on the job announcement analysis of educational technology professionals' positions and knowledge, skills, and abilities summary. And so the University of Florida folks that we're talking gave a magnificent presentation, did a great job in that the job analysis, which involved the U.S. sampling, showed titles for educational technologists vary, but there are some common domains of practice, and these are well encapsulated in the standards or competencies of the field that we can find from major organizations such as ASTD, ISD, ACT, and of course, the International Board of Standards for Performance Training and Instruction, or IPSTPI. 
The analysis included ID job descriptions, which I could take issue with since an ed tech and an ID in my mind are not always equivalent as a job category. Not all IDs will do development, but in any case, the bottom line from this analysis was also that the teamwork and team building skills, as well as leadership and management, which are not the same thing, mind you, must be skills an ID and ed tech possess to both advance in the field as a career and to excel in the field as a professional. I recommend reading the research from these authors to learn more about what their study revealed in terms of job qualifications for educational technologists in the current era of practice as we see it here in the United States. So the next session was great expectations and examination of the alignment of graduate student expectations with professional experiences. And the study focused on PhD students only and not EDD or MA level learners, so not a master's degree or an EDD. There was some lamenting at the conference generally and in this program that bachelor's programs are lacking for IDs in the U.S., but a majority of announcements still require a bachelor's degree. So another point from the session included the findings that the core of ID programs are best aligned for students and students' minds, as given in this study, when they involve ID models, cognition, evaluation, front-end analysis, and other core principles. But practice being very contextual for IDs means that training in these areas must be diverse to ensure students and graduates are equipped to work in multiple contexts. The session also noticed that practicing students with their master's degrees tended to want more skills in e-learning and multimedia, which would be arguably appropriate for an EDD program, not a PhD program. And that brought up a whole other debate about the blurring of lines between the the PhD and the EDD degrees, which was far beyond the scope of this session to handle. Overall, I recommend reading this research as well to learn more about what doctoral learners in a PhD program expected from their program for anyone thinking of designing a doctoral or even master's level program in ID. So next up was a session called Towards Holistic Learning Analytics, Empirically Validating Models for Student Profiles. Okay, so during this session, the presenter spoke of holistic requirements for a complex modeling system that was developed to encapsulate the data collected and used in analysis for the study. One major point from the session is that learning analytics can be defined as a field of practice that uses dynamic information about learners and learning environments, adding, eliciting, and analyzing these for real-time information, prediction, and optimization of learning processes and learning environments. I think that's a very effective definition of learning analytics personally. Other important points I gleaned from the presentation of this research were the differences between comparative analysis and descriptive and prescriptive analysis as forms of research stemming from learning analytics. So you can read about the description there on the screen again by pausing the video and you might follow up with me or with the session presenters from Open Universities of Australia and Deakin University if you have any questions. Next up was the cognitive tools to support collaboration, technology and pedagogy at work. And I have quite a few tweets from this session you can review, but ultimately this session discussed how Google Drive was used to facilitate learning successes. Instructors had global access to folders, while students had local access to group folders for their teams. Some templates were uploaded as advanced organizers and all was a manual setup of the, by the faculty. I'm a proponent of the use of the drive system for teaching and learning as well as collaboration on ID projects. One advantage they had at the University of Missouri for the study was that they had opportunities for face-to-face -face or in-person training on the use of the system, which helped bring everyone up to speed faster on using it. Still, this technique would be just as doable, I could argue, for learners and faculty and designers at a distance using a webinar training session. So next up was the graduate programs in instructional design and technology, factors that support program development, growth, and sustainability. And Jonathan McCallum from the University of Tampa presented, and this was a really amazing study session, and it was probably the most engaging that I attended, which was why I saved it for last. That's right, we're almost finished with this. Hang in here a little longer if you want to hear about this particular session. So this amazing session on a study of graduate programs in instructional design is one that I literally have pages of notes from, so summarizing it here will be somewhat difficult in the interest of time. Some highlights are that Jonathan spoke of the market study conducted by the University of Tampa, largely in the Tampa Bay area, during the design of their IDT program. He noted the program had two years to launch, and I would argue on his experiences that this timeline is about average when we factor in things like send approvals, internal and external approvals from accreditors, and so on. So all the work that goes into creating a program takes time if well done. Other major highlights from this session were the findings from employers, and I'm sure that's what you want to hear about. So employers wanted 
were once that were found in the market study included that all employers demanded internship practicums or other real-world experiences. Development skills with technology software were also a non-negotiable from employers, and this included training and print materials design, which was somewhat surprising since print is, seems to be on its way out, but ultimately many organizations still use print. So this implies that Adobe Acrobat Professional is a needed skill technology. Other technologies specifically mentioned included Articulate, Storyline, Captivate, and Camtasia Studio and PowerPoint, which I'm using in part with YouTube to create this summary, by the way. Project management at a high level was also seen as necessary, but specific knowledge of Agile, Scrum, and other methods were desired. Overall, though, it was seen that the ability to learn methods that was most important because, as Jonathan's study showed, most organizations provided on-the-job training in the area of their methods, but that students' ability to manage multiple projects and to learn the design methods of an organization were a must. So being adaptive and agile to learning new methods of your employer is an essential skill, students, and also a key thing to integrate into curriculum for all my program designer and, and colleagues out there listening. So another finding was that employers desire graduates who can speak about learning theory and instructional systems design processes, including knowing how to apply adult learning theory, and that graduates must also be able to write curriculum for multiple audiences and skill levels. This speaks to the value of a front-end analysis and needs assessment as an essential skill to be taught in a program. There was also mention of budgeting and management and basic human resource knowledge and skills as being deemed increasingly important by organizations if graduates want to advance in their careers to management or supervisory roles. And in fact, the presenter emphasized really passionately the management domain and how necessary employers saw it to curriculum training at the master's level. Jonathan also noted that problem-solving skills were desired by employers and evidence of problem-based curriculum and the use of portfolios was desired. So students in instructional design and all my professional pals out there, if you're still listening, if you don't have a portfolio yet, you might want to start developing one soon. All right, next up, what is this? Okay, that's it. Seriously, for the major highlights of the session, I'm done. This has been enough talking by me. Hopefully, you've gotten some great ideas. This concluding slide is just a shout-out to AACT. It's a fabulous organization with awesome swag at this year's conference. I will get much use out of the quick portable charger pictured on the screen. If you're planning a conference this year and you need a swag idea, I recommend this one, a portable charger, because it's obviously a very useful item to provide your conference attendees because we're a wired and connected group at the EdTech and Instructional Design Conferences. We need to be powered up to, to make these great notes for your sessions. All right, to close out, again, a reminder, you can follow me on Twitter and see the back channel from this conference at Curious Mind, and also search for the tweets from the conference using the hashtag ACT14, or contact ACT directly using their Twitter handle, at ACT. Thanks for your time learning with me during this conference shareback learning summary. I hope you've enjoyed the experience. Feel free to share this with your own students or colleagues who may be interested. I'm wishing you all well. Goodbye for now.